Thank you, David, and thank you for doing this. It's wonderful to provide a venue in which people can just uh, join in on the call and hear wonderful news, good news, good truth from God's word. Uh, thank you to those of you who have signed in tonight. And um, just a word or two about myself. Yes, I'm Mike Knox from Manitoba, just above North Dakota, a little bit there. And uh, I'm married to Helen. We have four daughters, and uh, they're all fairly young still. And um, uh, yes, we, we're just happy to be with you here. I want to read two verses from, from the Bible. I have my littlest Bible with me tonight, and there's a reason for that, um, which I'll unveil later on tonight. But just look at two verses from Romans chapter 3 with me. And if you do have a Bible with you, feel free to look it up for yourself. And otherwise, you can just hear me read it. Romans 3, Paul's great letter to the Romans. And verse 21 says this, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. I, I was telling you I have four daughters and they're all quite young. And that means I get a lot of little scraps of paper still. Uh, here are two of the latest that have landed on my desk. I get a lot of little scraps of paper. And to be honest, some of them do go in the garbage, but I try to keep some of them to treasure them later. But I've been reflecting recently on how just a little scrap of paper is all it takes sometimes to change your life. That's at least what the person who goes up and, and puts his credit card down to buy a lotto ticket believes. He believes that if he gets the right little scrap of paper with the right combination of numbers in it, it could change his life. It's something we've experienced in a small way recently where we've gone to the mail and, and opened it up. And there is a, a mailing from the specialist office. And there's a diagnosis. And for many that get these it can change their life, right? And uh, But maybe the, the greatest example I can give you of how just a scrap of paper can change your life is to take you to the island of Utoya. It's 2011, and there's a bunch of young people gathered on that island. Um, they're all members of the youth wings of fairly progressive political parties there in Norway. And it's 2011, they're there on the island, a whole bunch of them, and they're there for some rally, I can't remember what, when a man comes ashore onto the island, dressed at least, in a police uniform, and he gathers young people around him, and he uh, uh, informs them that a bomb has gone off in the nation's capital, and he is there to protect them. What he doesn't tell them is that he is the man who set that bomb off. The police uniform is just a disguise. And uh, he begins to open fire on them with his assault rifle. And the next 1.5 hours is nothing but a killing spree. And at the end of it, 69 people, mostly young people, lie dead. And some parents who had their children there begin to hear news of what has gone on, this terrible massacre. And some of them have children with cell phones and they're able to text them and say, it's okay, it's okay. But of course, others heard nothing. And so they begin to assemble on the island and they meet in a hotel there on the island and, and someone gets up with, with a list of names, 13 names. 13 names of young people who have been identified and are still alive somewhere in a hospital, somewhere in Norway. And of course, every single parent in that room wants their child to be on the list. And so the person starts and he, he reads the top name on the list, starts at the top. And as soon as he mentions that name, there's a family in one corner of the room that erupts in joy and celebration. But for all the other parents in the room, they realize their chances of experiencing that joy themselves has just gone down by one thirteenth. And another name is mentioned, another name is read, and every time a name is read, there's a family that erupts in joy. And there's a mother in there who is the mother of a girl named Yilva. And every time she's hoping, it's going to be Yilva, it's going to be Yilva, and it's not Yilva. And finally, the person reading comes to the twelfth name. There's one name left, many disappointed parents so far, 13th name, and it wasn't Yilva. And all Yilva's mother's hope evaporates into despair.
But then another police officer comes in, this time a real police officer. And uh, he has a little scrap of paper, just a little scrap of paper. And he hands it up to the person reading the names. And the person clears his throat and says, there's one more young person been identified. Uh, not identified, sorry. We don't know the person's name, but she's a girl. And Yilva's mom begins to experience a slight, slight kernel of hope. And, uh, and the person says, looking at the scrap of paper, she's between 14 and 20 years old. And again, Yilva's mom thinks, okay, okay, that's, that's Yilva. So far, so good. 1.62 meters tall. I don't know if you Americans are able to translate that into uh, imperial metric into imperial or not, but certainly Yova's mom knew that's that's about right. That's about right. That's about her length. Dark hair, blue eyes. Yova's mom's hope rises and rises and rises, and then the person says a distinctive scar on her neck, and Yova's mom says it's her. It's her. I my daughter is alive. From the deepest of sorrows to the brightest, happiest of joys, all in a moment, all because of one little scrap of paper. Listen, I don't know where you're at tonight. Maybe I'm speaking to someone who's going through depression. Maybe you feel racked with guilt. Maybe, like so many of us, you feel alone, you feel scared, you're uncertain, you're unsure. And what you need is just a little scrap of paper. Now, I normally don't treat my Bible this way, but I just want to make a point. The words on this little scrap of scripture that I read to you, these words could bring you tremendous joy and blessing tonight if you will but listen to them. Here, here they are again. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Those first two words, but now, they signal it all, don't they? That there is hope, that there is a possible salvation. Uh, Paul, Paul has been writing here in this letter to the Romans, and the first little bit of it is like, is like that first list of names the man read up in the hotel lobby, where the, the longer he read, the more Yilva's hope went down. The beginning of Paul's letter to the Romans, the more you read it, the, the more depressed you get. The more fearful you get, the, the, the unhappier you get, because it's full of, of bad news. Bad news that the wrath of God has come upon all of our unrighteousness and our ungodliness. Paul begins to focus on, on the, the really obvious sinners in our world. He begins to talk about the party revelers and, and the people that are going to the sorority parties and all this stuff and, and just living loose and so on. And he, and he talks to them about how you know, they're worshiping um, idols and, and they're taking God's created things and they're worshiping them instead of the true God. And, uh, and he begins to talk about all these like sexual sins and unthankfulness and ungratitude. And, and, and he's saying, you guys are under the wrath of God. This is bad news. And the hope in our hearts goes down, down, down. This is not good. But Paul notices some people in the room are really excited about Paul's preaching against all these party animals. And these are the religious people. And, and some of them maybe are saying, oh, men, preach it, Brother Paul. This is great. Tell those bad sinners how awful they are. And so finally, Paul calls out one of them, if you keep reading this letter. And he says, hey, you, you there, you there who stood up and, and pointed down at all the sinners and said, listen up, you sinners, you, you. You who judge those people I've just mentioned, you've just judged yourself. Why? Because you, the one judging, you practice the same things. No, you don't go out cavorting on the beach, maybe with all of them. But in your heart, you want to, right? No, you don't do all the hedonistic sins that they're doing, but in your heart, you want to. He's saying, in judging them, you're, you do the very same things you judge. And so finally, he comes just shortly before the verses I read. And Paul comes and says this, listen, whether you're religious or you're irreligious. Whether you're someone who tries and gets refugees to a better country and sponsor a refugee to come to your, your neighborhood. Or whether you're someone who's, who's taking part in human trafficking. He says, all of us, all of us have sinned. None is righteous. No, not one. 
all have turned aside. Together we have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He says, all of us have sinned and under are under God's judgment. But now, but now, all the hope has gone out of us. We're under God's wrath. We're under God's judgment. We're under God's condemnation. This is a whole lot of bad news for us. But then this wonderful expression, but now, one great preacher who God used mightily in London said, these are the most wonderful words in all the Bible. But now there's hope. There's hope. I was um, visiting a young man recently. He called me up a few weeks ago and um, he was weeping on the phone. This is a man I met with before. He called himself an agnostic and didn't believe in God. And finally, he called me up a, a few weeks ago, as I said, and he's just weeping on the phone and feeling the darkness and the emptiness. So I canceled my evening plans and I drove to where he lives. And pretty soon I was seated up beside him on the couch where he lay. And he's just weeping and crying and shaking and in total darkness and fear. He said, he pointed at the couch. He said, I don't even know if this couch is real anymore. I don't know what's true. I don't know what's real. My life is empty. I'm so sad. I said to him, Melvin, I said, truth, salvation, reality has to come from outside of us. We need good news. We need someone from outside of us to speak truth to us. And that's what this, if you don't mind me calling it, this little scrap of scripture does. God himself speaks to us and says, are you hopeless? Are you helpless? Are you depressed? Do you feel guilty? Are you anxious? And he says, listen, but now there's good news. There's hope. Listen to me. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. Now you think, what on earth does that mean? The righteousness of God has been manifested. Well, righteousness, if you have righteousness, righteousness is, is uh, sort of your, your record of all your achievements. It's a record of all your achievements and, and all the things about you, all your assets, all the things that give you capital, all the things that make you acceptable. That's your righteousness. Let me just give you an example. Um, here's a little mask I, I got here. And um, there was a time in a nearby city here, to, to close to me, where masks were optional when you went into the grocery store, the superstore. But, but everyone was, was wearing them except for me. And, and I, I walked in and it's like, everyone's got a mask on except for me. And what did I feel? I felt unrighteous. I felt like I was ashamed. I felt like I wasn't welcome. I, I had to walk through the door kind of, kind of, um, uh, with shame and, and with a lack of confidence. Like I'm, I'm not acceptable. I, I'm unrighteous. I, I don't have my righteousness on. And another time I went on, I went to the superstore and I, I put my mask on and, uh, and there were other people that didn't have one on. And do you know what? I felt, oh yeah, I've got confidence going in now. Look at these other people. Hey, they don't have their masks on, but I'm totally acceptable. When people see me coming into this grocery store, they totally accept me. I'm totally approved because I have on a righteousness. It's, it's my face mask. Of course, little face mask isn't a very solid righteousness, is it? You can forget it. Might not be good enough. Some people say it doesn't help. Whatever, whatever, whatever. And the rules could reverse someday and whatever. Righteousness. This is a very flimsy righteousness, but this is what our text says. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested. In other words, the Bible is saying in this verse, the Bible is saying, listen, Poor, poor whoever you are, whatever trouble you're in, and whatever guilt you feel, listen, God is making available to you his own righteousness, this solid, eternal, perfect righteousness that if you take it, if you receive it, he's making it available. It's up for grabs. You can have it. And if you have it, you can be filled with a sense of confidence. God's righteousness is something that opens doors for you. Just like I had confidence going into Superstore with my righteousness on. If we have God's righteousness on us, if we have a right status with God, if my status before God changes so that it is righteous, then I can know that the door of heaven itself is open and I can come in with confidence. God is saying, 
I'm making available to you my own righteousness. Now, here's what it says next. On this little piece of paper in my Bible, there's a little scrap of scripture that can totally change your life. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Because someone says, how do I get this righteousness? How do I, how do I clothe myself and, and have this righteousness of God that makes me confident, that, that, that makes me know that I'm welcome and I can come confidently into God's presence, knowing that I'm right with him? How can I get my hands on such a thing as that? Well, it says the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Apart from your good works, apart from your own moral performance. You see, elsewhere in this letter, prior to this, he has he has gone to great lengths to say that you and I can't keep the law. We think, oh, we'll get this righteousness by doing good. But then he says there is no good. No one is good. No, not one. We think, oh, but, but by, by keeping the law, by, by obeying the commandments, if I really try to live a righteous life, then I'll get God's righteousness on me. But he says, no, 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 no. He says, by works of the law, no one will be righteousified. No one will be justified. Instead, he says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, which means it's available not by being good, not by earning favor, not by working hard to accumulate a great track record religiously. It's available apart from the law. Well, you say, but but is it legitimate then? I mean, if, if someone can just have this righteousness apart from being good and apart from a moral life, is this a legitimate righteousness then? Well, then he says this. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. In other words, Paul's saying you can have God's righteousness given to you as a status for you. You can have that. Apart from the law, and yet it's totally biblical. It's totally legitimate. It's it, it's it's it stands up legally. Why? Because he says the whole Bible bears witness to it. This is the biblical way of being righteous, of being saved, of being right, of having a good relationship with God. This isn't some legal backwater. This isn't some some righteousness of God available on the black market. No, this is a totally legal, biblical, righteous way of getting God's righteousness, apart from the law, apart from your moral performance. So you say, well, then how can I get it? How can I get this? How can I be saved from my sense of guilt and my sins? How can I be saved from the fear of death and wondering if I'm going to make it into God's good books in the end of it all? Well, he says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. And then he says this, the righteousness of God, that is through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness, God's righteousness is available not according to the law, not by keeping the law, not by being better than others. And, and like me, when I went to the supermarket, looking down at the others who didn't have the righteousness that I have. No, it's available through faith in the Lord Jesus, through trusting in him. In other words, God's perfect, infinite, holy righteousness, by which you can have confidence for the day of death and judgment, and confident that you're right with God. This righteousness, this new status and new standing with God cannot be achieved by you, but just received. Can't be earned. Must must just be taken, can't be worked for, must just be received. This righteousness isn't available to you by, by trying. It's available to you by trusting. This is good news for those of us like me who are moral failures. I can be made righteous and I have been made righteous by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by trusting in the Lord Jesus. Why? What did the Lord Jesus ever do? So that you and I, who are guilty sinners and have no hope and can't save ourselves by our good works, by our law keeping, by anything, by, by pain, by being in the right political way of things, by being in the right family, none of these things will work. How can you and I be made righteous through faith in Jesus Christ? Simply by this. As Paul goes on to explain, this same Lord Jesus 
went forward at the cross and took our punishment for us. It says there in Romans that God put forward the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus is the eternal son of God who left heaven and came down into our world. And he who was God himself became man without ceasing to be God and thus became the perfect mediator. As God, he was perfect and holy. And as man, he was able to live and die in our place. And the Lord Jesus lived a perfect life of absolute righteousness and sinlessness, of complete obedience and devotion to God. He lived the life that you and I should have lived, but we can't. And the Lord Jesus went to the cross and all as part of his plan and the father's plan and the plan of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus went to answer the music for us. He went to face the music that we deserve. He went to, to face the judgment. The condemnation, the wrath of God upon us that we deserve. The Lord Jesus, it says in the Bible, was the righteous one who died for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. And so, by virtue of his being both God and man, and by virtue of his living a perfect, righteous life, absolutely free from sin, and by virtue of his deliberately taking the place and paying the pet debt that. And, and taking the punishment that sinners like you and me deserve. And by virtue of the fact that three days later he rose from the dead, God accepting all that Christ had done and ventured upon the cross. By virtue of all that Jesus is and by virtue of all that he's done. All that a guilty sinner must do to receive God's own righteousness. Is to turn from his own trying and doing. And to rest by faith. On the Lord Jesus Christ. This is good news. This is good news. Good news for the guilty, for the lonely, for the depressed. Good news for those who feel they have no hope, whose, whose eternity seems so uncertain. Good news for you. Listen, but now, apart from church, apart from religion, apart from trying to live the best life you can live, apart from it all, you can receive God's righteousness by faith. By trusting, by leaning in the Lord Jesus, who died the righteous one in place of the unrighteous. Well, what does it say next? It says that this righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God, that is through faith in Jesus Christ. Now listen, I come to the most perhaps offensive part of the whole good news gospel message about the Lord Jesus. It's this. This righteousness is for all who believe. I remember preaching in a, in a homeless shelter and I was preaching about what the Bible says happens to us if we if we do not trust in Christ. In other words, I was teaching from the Bible how if we reject the Lord Jesus and say no to him, Upon our death, we will be sentenced and judged and we will go to hell forever and will forever and eternally be under God's righteous wrath against our sin. You can understand how some of the people that were listening got very offended by that. Listen, what I've just read is maybe equally offensive, maybe even more offensive. And it's this. That this righteousness offered as a free gift. To anyone who trusts in Christ, it is available for anyone, to all who believe, which means that that man I told you about put on the police uniform and killed 69 people. That if someone went with this same scrap of scripture to his jail cell in Norway today and told that man, that if he trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, he could be saved. You know what? He could. He could. This is, this is the offensiveness of the gospel. That possibly someone as bad as that murderer, that mass murderer, could end up with a right relationship with God. That he could come before God, where God would sit as a judge and would say, to you, young man, you murderer of 69 people, I declare you righteous in my sight. 
I give you my own righteous status before me. Welcome, you can come in. The doors of heaven are open for you. <clears throat> A relationship with God is open for you, you forgiven murderer. And meanwhile, maybe someone who lives a good life listening to me right now who would not believe in the Lord Jesus would spend eternity locked out, rejected in the darkness under God's judgment and wrath. This is the offensiveness of the gospel. But it's also the good news of the gospel because listen, if that man who could kill all those people, <coughs> if this offer is truly for all who believe, including people in jail cells, then you can be saved as well. No matter what skeletons are in your closet, no matter what hidden secrets are in your past, no matter what evil thoughts ripple across your heart at certain times of the night or day, you too can be saved by faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what it says that this righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Why? Because it says there is no distinction. For all of us have sinned and constantly, second by second, me included, we fall short of the glory of God, but are also justified, declared righteous by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Lord Jesus is not just the Savior for little sinners. He's the savior for big sinners. And if he's the savior for big sinners, then he can be the savior of a little sinner too. So trust in Christ. This little scrap of scripture, it can change your life. It's what you need, whether you recognize it or not. Good news from outside of us. Good, happy, joyful news. This is what we need. Someone. The mouth of God itself to speak to us this good, glad tidings of, of forgiveness, of deliverance, of salvation. This little scrap of scripture that says, listen, you're all sinners. We're all guilty. There's no hope. <clears throat> Religion and a life of good works cannot save you. It can only convict you more. All of us, our mouths are, are shut before God as a judge. We have nothing to say for ourselves. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested. It is available. It is on offer to everyone listening to this Zoom call right now. It is on offer. The righteousness of God has been manifested, and it's on offer apart from the law. Not by your earning, not by your achieving. It's only for those who will receive. It's the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Won't you turn your eyes and attention now? To the Lord Jesus. It's time, it's time right now to stop looking in here for our deliverance. If I was uh, uh, sick with some horrible disease, I could look in here all I want, and, and my antibodies and my my own body's defense system probably isn't going to be sufficient to save me. I need to look outside. I need to say, is there a cure? Is there someone that can take something outside of me and inject it into me that will save my life? And it's the same for us in our sins. It's time to stop looking in here now. Okay, Everyone who's listening, it's time to stop looking here. It's time to look outside yourself. 2,000 years ago, God's son loved you so much that he died on the cross. He swapped places with sinners. He traded places with the unrighteous. Oh, and he did it all as part of his father's plan. He loves you. You're loved tonight. He came from the outside. He came from heaven. He entered our world. He came in. He took on human flesh. He became a human. He took our sins upon himself and, and, and drew God's wrath and righteous indignation against himself in our place and rose again. And now he sits at God's right hand and in faith, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you can have your record of unrighteousness wiped away and instead be given the righteousness of God. Well, you say, this sounds awfully legal and cold. Well, you're right, it does. But first of all, let me say, that is a good thing. We want this thing to be legal, right? We want this, we want this salvation. We, we want a relationship. We want a deliverance from God that will stand up where no court of appeal later on can reverse it. We want, 
We want this to be legal, this salvation that we need. But it's not just legal. The old preachers used to say this. They used to say, this righteousness of God, it's more than just forgiveness. It's more than just forgiveness. They, they used to say it this way. Forgiveness means you can go. If God forgives you your sins, it means you can go now. Punishment's over. You can go. I forgive you. But the old preachers used to say this. They said, but if you get the righteousness of God, it means not you can go. It means you can come. You can come. You see, God's righteousness is such that it's more than just the forgiveness of sins. It's not only that all my bad things I've done, my crimes against God and humanity, it's not just that they've all been forgiven and done away with and hidden and they'll never be brought out again. That would only put me at neutral, right? That would just leave me at a neutral, at a zero, having nothing bad for which I'll be judged, but nothing particularly good either to make me really accepted before God. It'd be like going into superstore without my righteousness on, feeling Oh, I don't belong here. People are judging me. Uh, uh, whatever I have here, I, I feel I feel unclothed, undressed. I feel unfit. No one wants me here. I'm a liability here. But instead, when we receive God's righteousness, it's not just the cancellation of all our wrong, but it is a positive thing. It is that I, to my account and, and to my status, I receive the infinite, perfect, righteous standing of God himself, which means this, which means I don't have to go, I can come. And so can you. God isn't just offering forgiveness of sins to you tonight. And he's not just offering you an escape from hell and the punishment you deserve for your sins. He's offering you far more. He's saying, I don't want you just to be at neutral. I want to positively instate you with my own righteous credibility i want you to be able to run to me with confidence i want you to be able to approach the door of my presence the door of my home the door of my heaven with confidence knowing not only am i a judge who's now not going to charge you but i'm a father who's going to welcome you and so this isn't just a cold legal thing although we're very thankful it is legal and it stands up at the highest court, the Supreme Court of Heaven. But it's so much more. God didn't just want us to escape punishment in hell, but he wants us to know his love and intimacy. He wants us to truly enter a relationship with him where he's not just a judge who's no longer angry at us, but he's a father who loves us, a father who's pleased with us, a father who welcomes us. And it was because of God's intense desire that you not just be a pardoned criminal, but his own adopted son. It was for this that God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit both planned and carried out the great drama of redemption, where God's Son became human and lived and died for sinners and rose again to set us free. So, a little scrap of scripture. I'm going to read it one more time and then we'll be done. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested. It's available apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it is totally legal. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. When you first start reading Romans, it's like that first person reading the first piece of paper in Utoya, you get sadder and sadder and sadder. It seems bleaker and bleaker. But then Romans 3 verse 21 comes, but now. And all of a sudden there's hope. All of a sudden there's a little flicker of hope. And if you would trust in the Lord Jesus, you could keep reading. And the longer you read in this letter, the happier and more joyous you'd become until you come to Romans chapter 5 and discover this. That if you have been justified by faith, then you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. And not only that, but through the Lord Jesus, you have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And you rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Peace. 
access to grace, an open door to the presence of your loving Heavenly Father, the fullness of his love in your heart, a hope that no matter what happens to this world of ours and to your life of yours, no matter what happens, you have a hope that goes beyond the grave. This is all available to those who will receive the righteousness of God through faith, through trusting in Jesus Christ. I implore you to trust in him now. If you don't, you're left in your unrighteousness. You're left under God's judgment. There's no need to be. Christ has gone under the judgment of God. He's faced the music for sinners. Trust in him and know what it is to come confidently to God, not with guilt, not with a dirty conscience, but with a confidence. God, I can come to you now. I need not fear death anymore, nor hell, nor judgment. I need fear nothing anymore because I have the very righteousness of God.